perhaps more than ever, dedicated reporters are going to great lengths to cover events throughout the world and report stories for the benefits of their readers. More and more, we are seeing those who are responsible for delivering the news actually becoming part of the news. The stakes are higher than ever. Investigative reporting has become, quite literally, a matter of life and death. The immediacy of the internet and all forms of social media put additional, press additional pressure on journalists. Competition can come from anyone with a cell phone to take a picture, type a post, or share a video. So what motivates these men and women to take risks and report the news? We have with us three panelists who have taken on the job of reporting challenging stories, often from some of the most dangerous parts of the globe. We are grateful that they have agreed to share their insights and experiences with us. We're pleased to have Joe Bergantino, Tracy Shelton, and Amir Tibone. Joe Bergantino is presumably recognizable to many of you as the I-Team reporter for WBZ-TV in Boston, a position he held for 22 years. Joe has won many of the broadcasting industry's most prestigious awards. Currently, he teaches at Boston University and Boston College and is the executive director and co-founder of the New England Center for Investigative Reporting training journalists worldwide. Tracy Shelton is a multimedia journalist working for Global Post and Ground Truth as a reporter, photojournalist, and video documentary, documentary producer. Stationed in Turkey, she has covered conflict and the legacy of war in eight countries, most notably Libya, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. She previously worked as a senior correspondent for Global Post covering the Middle East and North Africa. Amir Tibon joins us from Israel, where he lives and reports extensively for Walla News, Israel's most widely read news website. There, he's responsible for covering Israel's foreign relations and the Prime Minister's office. In 2013, Amir was awarded the Israeli Documentary Forum's Best TV Report Prize for a segment he filmed covertly inside Syria. Amir co-authored the New Republic's behind-the-scenes features on the last round of Israeli-Palestinian peace talks, a feature for which he's been nominated for a National Magazine Award. He's been a guest on CNN, MSNBC, and Al Jazeera. He's reported from 12 different countries in the last two years. Our moderator tonight is Aaron Schachter. Aaron is an assignment editor for Public Radio International's The World. He previously spent eight years living and working as a correspondent in the Middle East first in Jerusalem, and then in Beirut. He covered the second Palestinian Intifada, as well as the aftermath of the US invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. Aaron has reported for more than half a dozen other countries in the region, including Syria, Pakistan, and Iran. For opening remarks, we are joined by Charlie Sennett via YouTube. Charlie worked hard to conceptualize this program and had hoped to be here with us. However, he was called to Afghanistan for Global Post, the online news company he co-founded. Charlie's 30 years of experience in international reporting led him to launch the Ground Truth Project, which works with the next generation of correspondents to report from the, from the field on the most challenging social justice stories that will shape their futures, and to do so with great attention to safety for standards for safety. Charlie invites you all to follow the launch of Ground Truth Project's Forever Stand, the road to ending America's longest war, which will air the week of April 20th on editorial partners including PRI The World, WGBH News, Global Post, and others. We're delighted to announce that tonight's program is being recorded and will be streaming on the WGBH Forum Network. The Forum Network hosts lectures presented by community organizations and educational institutions to promote lifelong learning. We are pleased to be a part of this and hope you'll take advantage to view this and future Hot Button School Conversations programs. We also want to express our thanks to the generous donors of this program, many of whom are here tonight. They are the ones that make John Samen's Hot Button School Conversations series possible. Their support allows us to bring in these incredible speakers while keeping ticket prices accessible for the entire community. If you would like to support these programs, please visit bostonjcc.org 
you can select the HBCC as a choice. Finally, as always, we thank Mark Sokol, Fiona Epstein, Becky Rolnick, and all the JCC staff that helped make this program possible, and thanks to you for attending. And now, over to Charlie. I'm Charlie Center of the Ground Truth Project, and we're in Afghanistan. Sorry I'm not with you tonight at JCC, but I wanted to give you some sense of, uh, of the journey that we're on that kept me from being there tonight. Um, we're here in Afghanistan as part of a project that we're calling Foreverstan, the road to ending America's longest war. The road we refer to is a literal road. It's called the Ring Road, and it surrounds Afghanistan. It circles and connects all of the major cities. We're near Mazar Sharif. And just off the ring road, there's a dirt road that leads to the Kalajangi Fortress, and that's where we are. This fortress was the site of one of the biggest battles after September 11th. I was here then working for the Boston Globe, and I was covering this story on the ground. It was really an amazing battle. You might remember it. It was a huge prison uprising in which more than 600 Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters rose up, captured the weapons of their guards, and took over this fortress. And there were American military who were here. And it really was a meaningful and very powerful battle in the sense that it was the first American casualty in what would become America's longest war. And it happened right here. There's a monument just over here to Mike Spann, who's the former Marine CIA contractor who was killed during this prison uprising. That death, that, that part of, of the many lives that were lost here in Afghanistan, Afghan and American lives, is a starting point. And it's this place that we chose to start our journey of the Ring Road because this is the right launching point for trying to understand incredibly complex terrain here in Afghanistan. Terrain that was so apparent to us if we were willing to see it, just how treacherous a place this was, how resilient a place this was, how, how this place had always resisted empires, from Genghis Khan to the British to the Soviets to the American Empire. Fourteen years of war here, the resiliency of the Afghan people, the sense of an impenetrable country that will never allow itself to be occupied should be well aware to us at this point. We really should understand that. That's the whole purpose of this series. We wanted to find a way to tell the story of modern Afghanistan. So for me to be back here 14 years since that news event has been really powerful. I've seen a country that still has a lot of the things the same. There's still a sort of biblical era farming that goes on here. There's still a feel of people who have suffered greatly from war. That hasn't changed. But there's also a feeling of momentum. This is a busy place now with new hotels, a new airport, and the ring road has created a lot of commerce here in Afghanistan. On our journey, we're working with Ben Brody, photographer who's here with me in Afghanistan. Ben has been looking at the military handover uh, for years, and his work looking at how the U.S. military is handing off to the Afghan National Army is very important in terms of understanding where this goes in the future. Beth Murphy, documentary producer also on our team, has been looking at one girl's school. And through the eyes of that one girl's school, we see a country that is very fearful of the return of the Taliban. The Taliban, if it does come back and take power again when the U.S. departs, will more than likely close all those girls' schools that have been opened through the, the great effort of the Afghan people and the support of the U.S. and the other allies of the international community. The other aspect we really wanted to look at were millennials. Jean McKenzie, who works with us, who knows this country very well, has been looking at those people born after 1980. That's the year when the Soviet occupation really takes hold. And that's the year when the Mujahideen, or the resistance to that occupation, was born. Many years of fighting ensued before the Soviets finally pulled out. And when they did pull out, that led to a civil war. That civil war lasted forever, and then led to September 11th. Al-Qaeda was based here with the support of the Taliban, and it was from this land that the attack really emanated, uh, the attack by Al-Qaeda and by Osama bin Laden. That generation, born of 1980, has known nothing but war. First there was the Soviet occupation, then there was their own civil war, and then of course after 9-11 there was the U.S. presence and the Allies. And that war continues. Fourteen years on, the United States is still here. So it's a big story to tell about a very complicated place that is 
impenetrable and resilient. And I think we really need to now, 14 years on, step back and get on that road and look at how Afghanistan is doing to try to cover what we're calling forever stand, the road to America's longest war and how we're going to end that war. I hope you guys don't mind. I uh, wanted to slip into something a little more comfortable. <laughs> it's, um, this, of course, is a uh, flak jacket that I wore on uh, quite a few assignments uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere in, in the Israel and the West Bank during conflict there. Um, and in a way, I, I brought it because it symbolizes a shift that Charlie was talking about from the way that we used to cover, journalists used to cover conflict zones. There was a time when we could walk in with this press on our chest and feel somewhat indemnified from what was going on around us. We were uh, part of the danger, of course. The war is always dangerous. Conflict is dangerous. Um, but we, as journalists, never consider ourselves the target or a target. And that is what uh, has changed quite a bit in the, the last few years, both from an actual war zone perspective and, um, as we'll learn, just uh, reporting in general these days. Um, journalists are becoming targets in a wide variety of ways. Well, we've got great panelists here. We thank you for coming to uh, what will be, I think, a really interesting discussion about the ways that journalists these days are in jeopardy. We'll start um, with Tracy Shelton, who, as you heard, does some really wild and wonderful things in some of the world's most physically dangerous places. And we'll start with everyone here kind of laying out what they feel is, is um, puts journalists the most in jeopardy these days from their perspective. And we'll, we'll start with um, everyone telling us that, and then we'll have a little discussion, and then we'll bring you into the discussion with your questions, and we hope um, you'll enjoy the time. Tracy. Uh, well, I've been working in the Middle East for six years, covering mostly Iraq, Syria, and Libya. And as you mentioned, during that time, the risk that uh, journalists face on the I'm ground. I'm going to take this off. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they've both increased and changed dramatically in nature as well. Before, the major threat that we faced was from frontline work. Uh, putting yourself uh, in the line of fire was, is a calculated risk that you constantly reassess as the situation develops. And the second risk has also been, oh, always been from arrest or from kidnapping. But um, in the past, in general, uh, we were welcomed or even protected by the fighters who needed us to tell their stories to the world. And that was very much the situation in Syria from the beginning of the conflict. But today, with the rise of the Islamic State, we've seen a, a new phenomenon where extremist groups have developed their own propaganda networks via social media. So not only do they no longer see us as necessary, uh, but foreign journalists are actually being hunted down uh, to feature in horrific execution videos. Um, we lost uh, some very dear friends in um, Steve Sutliff and James Foley, uh, who worked with me at Global Post. And despite two, two years of constant efforts on the part of um, Global Post, of, of his family, and the entire journalism community, uh, we were unable to find any way to negotiate Jim's release. Uh, so that in itself, it shows the, the major shift in the risk that we're facing. And as a result, rather than personally accessing the, the truth of what's happening on the ground in Syria, uh, we're being forced to increasingly rely on, on second-hand information. So honestly, uh, the real situation inside Syria right now is largely unknown. And this has taken a heavy toll on the quality of journalism in the region, uh, and also a personal toll on all of us working on the ground, and also our editors uh, back here in the States, or wherever they, they might be, who are constantly forced to, to weigh the risks of these increasing threats with the value of ground reporting. Amir. 
Well, um, when I went into journalism, and I'm the youngest one here, so it wasn't so long ago, my dream was to do what Tracy's doing, uh, or what Aaron used to do, uh, which is to be a foreign correspondent, cover foreign wars and other areas, the most dangerous parts of the world. But I soon found out that I have a liability that will stop me from actually doing it, and that is my identity as an Israeli. Um, and when I work in these kinds of places, like Syria is a good example, my biggest fear is always to have my identity uh, exposed. And I'll tell one story from the field that really shows what it's like. Um, when, when I went into Syria in the end of 2012, um, it was with a colleague, we were two Israeli journalists, both of us have foreign passports, so we can pretend that we are somebody else, but not for a very, no, not, not like you can do, you know, for months to live, you know, as, a, as an Australian journalist. Um, we, we have to do very short visits. So we went into Syria to hang out with the Syrian rebels who are fighting against the government over there. And we decided between ourselves that we're going to ask them about everything, about the United States and Obama and Russia and Iran and the war and their families and their lives, but no questions on Israel because that would be too dangerous. If somehow they realize that we are Israelis, that would be the end of it. And this is before ISIS and before James Foley. It's, it's just the very fact that who we are is, is not, um, it's not accepted. So we go into Syria and we meet this really interesting group of rebels in the Idlib province, pretty close to the Syrian border with Turkey. And they take us to their commander so he can approve the uh, interview. We, we didn't enter with the, in an official way. We, we actually smuggled ourselves into the country. They take us to their commander and he says, okay, you look like nice guys. I'm going to give you an interview. Um, and about probably the first thing he says during the interview is, uh, our group of rebels, we're not extremists, we're not affiliated with Al-Qaeda, um, we don't have any problems with Christians or with Jews or with anybody else, and in fact, if Sharon, the Israeli uh, general, would come and fight with us against the Syrian regime, we would accept him as a brother. And we're sitting next to him and we're pretty amazed, <laughs> and it's so hard to control your own emotions because I want to... My instinct was to say, hey, brother, we're here. Yeah. <laughs> you, you called for us and we came. But you have to watch it so carefully because you don't know what the reaction will be if you actually expose your identity. And this is one story, I mean, from Syria and from other places. Uh, the last, the last uh, war zone I covered, although I wasn't in the midst of the fighting, was Ukraine. And in Ukraine, there's a huge Jewish community which is trapped inside the war. And also there, when you talk to like these ultra-nationalist fascist militias that are fighting from both sides, you also you ask yourself, should I say I'm from Israel? Should I say from somewhere else? And with what you described, that it's becoming danger, more dangerous for everybody. So for us, the, there are very few Israeli jour journalists who do this kind of work. It's even becoming more complicated. True. So from the youngest to the oldest reporter sitting here, um, I've been an investigative reporter uh, for 35 years, and um, I, I haven't done much foreign reporting. I, one of my most dangerous assignments was covering the State House here in Boston, <laughs> which actually can be quite dangerous when you really think about it. Um, but for the past seven years, as the co founder and executive director of the New England Center for Investigative Reporting, which does investigative reporting and is training a new generation of investigative reporters, I've had the uh, honor to travel around the world and train people how to do investigative journalism. Um, I've done it in Russia, in China, in Vietnam, in Croatia, in Serbia, in Brazil. Um, and I did some research before this panel tonight to kind of figure out whether or not uh, most journalists are killed in, the, in combat, as one would think, or in the line of fire. And the reality is that of the 1,121 journalists killed since 1992, most of them were local journalists covering local issues, and most of them were murdered just for doing journalism. None um, at the State House, though. None at the State House <laughs> that we know of. Um, and and that's, the, that's sort of the reality of doing journalism in the 21st century, in the late 20th century. Um, the most recent journalist killed, um, you may think, probably was in Syria. Um, but no, he was in Brazil. He was covering in a small town on the, on the border with Paraguay, um, 
a local election, and he was shot to death. Um, and his brother, in commenting on his sibling's murder, said, um, you know, that's the way we deal with journalists in this area. People shoot them. Um, so doing journalism is a dangerous job, not only in, in areas like the Middle East, but in areas all around the world. Uh, I'll tell you later my little story about being detained in Russia. Um, some would say I was in a fool's errand trying to teach investigative reporting in, in Russia. And we were detained for a full day, and I ended up in a Russian courtroom. But, um, but it happens all the time that in areas where you would think or would hope that journalists have the ability and the freedom to hold the powerful accountable, that just isn't the case. You know, one of the most interesting things I found in the last um, 15 years or so is, is, is the effect that technology has had on our business. Um, I, I'm in, I do radio, I've been doing radio for 25 years, and I never carried around a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which has happened, but, um, you know, the, the devices have gone from this to this to this, and now, you know, my iPhone can do as good a recording as just about anything I started with. Um, when, when I went to Iraq, I, I had a satellite modem, and I set up a, a modem in the middle of the desert, literally in the middle of the desert, unfolded this thing, and broadcasted back to America, and it was remarkable, right? Now anyone can be a journalist from anywhere with a laptop, um, there's Wi-Fi, there's internet just about everywhere, it, and, it, and it's a marvelous thing. You, you took a recorder into Syria, right? A, well, it was small kind of a camera. Small camera. Small camera, um, two microphones like this, and you're fixed. And you're, you're, a, you're a journalist. It, it's also, Joe, been a, a, a way that foreign governments bad guys, if you want to call it that, can track you as a journalist. I, I just wonder from all your experiences, how has um, technology changed things for you, for, for better or worse? Well, I guess in, in some ways, um, when we can't access areas in Syria, you do get a, a feel of what's happening because there's so many videos being posted on, on YouTube. There's so much happening with social media. So you can, you can't, although you can't rely on it, um, you can use it as a source to get an idea of what's going on. So in this way, it has been beneficial. But at, at the same time, you have these, uh, these groups now that are um, producing their own propaganda videos, and they don't, uh, they don't look to us anymore to uh, cover their side of the story in, a, right. in an unbiased way. They're just presenting it there themselves on, on YouTube, even Free Syrian Army and uh, the other groups inside Syria. They're making their own videos too and posting them on YouTube. Right, so it's, it's you get information, mm -hmm. but it's often hard to trust that information. Exactly, yeah. And, and it raises the bar. I mean, you yeah. know, it, because people have seen so much. People have seen so many videos from Syria, from Iraq, from Libya, from where. If you want to do a documentary report, you know, you have to, to do something really special because the people have seen all these crazy images. Uh, and that's maybe a good effect because we need to do a more thorough job and you know people are not looking for just you know a, a short two minute report they can get that you know from people who are actually not journalists just you know the, the two sides who are fighting with each other um, and you have to do a better storytelling and you have to, to capture better images and it's hard but I mean if you like doing it like we do so it's also fun in a way. And technology can be used against us. Um, when I was doing a training in, in Moscow a couple of months ago, um, one of the investigative reporters who was training with us uh, said that he changes his encryption on his computer uh, fairly often because he knows that they're monitoring his, his emails, his communication. In addition to that, he changes the way he goes home, the way he goes, goes to work each day because he knows he's being followed. But the technology, the can be used against us in many different ways, and that's certainly one of them. Well, the, the nice thing when I began in the Middle East in 2002 even, it's hard to remember back that far, but even Google wasn't uh, as big a deal as it was. Um, and and <laughs> I, I would travel around and, and my friends in Israel would say, Shachter, they're going to kill you. But nobody knew that they couldn't look me up yet. Most people there did not have internet. They didn't know who I was. And, and the feeling, as Tracy said, was that they, 
for the most part, people wanted you there. They wanted their stories told, whether they were good guys or bad guys, American forces or Iraqi forces or Palestinians. They wanted you to tell their story. And now, because of, of what you're all saying, they don't need us anymore, right? There's also a sense of disappointment that I feel that in Syria, for example, the media has been ineffective in a way. Um, you know, when, when I went to Syria, and uh, most of the people I talked to thought that we were Americans, not Israelis, but they kept telling us it was a short time after the elections in the United States when Obama was reelected, and they kept saying, okay, we understand. He couldn't do anything because he had an, ele an election before, but now he's, he, he's elected. He's going to come and save us, and, and you guys should please tell our stories. People are very cooperative. P please tell our stories. Please show it. And some of the people we talked to found out that we were Israelis. They didn't care. Okay, you know, just do it, put it up, and that didn't help. And when people get the feeling that the media is not effectual anymore, so they lose this kind of hope that if they talk to us, it will really change something. Yeah, it changed very dramatically in Syria over like the first year. As you said, people were very welcoming. Yeah, and I, I saw that as it developed when you entered into the second and third year, people, when you came to ask them questions, they'd be like, what's the point? Why am I talking to you? Uh, it, I've been telling the media, media have been producing this for so long, and what does it change? They feel we're used, worse. maybe. They feel that we're using them yeah. more than... Or that it's pointless. But, but in Ukraine, it's still different. Like in Ukraine, I was there uh, about three months ago. People there still want to talk, and they still appreciate, they think the media can influence their image in the West. You know, that they, over there, it's, it's still different. But if the war drags on another year or two, I guess we'll see the same kind of influence. Joe, Joe um, I guess for the most part, um, the dictator um, is falling around the world. Um, is, is it becoming easier to get stories, just regular stories from different places, whether you're in Russia or anywhere in, in, in America even? Has, has technology made it easier for you or harder for you? Well, you know, I think since WikiLeaks, um, there have been these great document dumps, as we refer them to. Um, some great work has been done by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, um, where they've, they've, they've documented money laundering around the world, uh, dictators moving money offshore to other, other countries. There's a lot of investigative reporting going on, uh, despite the fact that it's becoming increasingly more difficult to do it. Um, I mean, Russia's a good example. There was a brief period where it was a little easier. Now it's extremely difficult. I was just talking to a, a, a colleague in Romania who is thinking with working with people in Russia about thinking about starting an investigative reporting center that would be outside Russia covering Russia. Because when I was there in October, for example, um, the Kremlin announced that, that essentially the foreign ownership of media in Russia would, be, uh, would pretty much end in the next two years. Most of the opposition press in that country is owned by uh, people outside of, the, of Russia, not Americans, but the Finns and the Swedes, I believe. Um, so I think it's becoming much harder to do investigative reporting on one level. On the other hand, whistleblowers um, with Snowden, with, through, through what's, what WikiLeaks did, I think, are empowered in some ways to feel like they can release information. But, but then, you know, what happened with person who leaked to WikiLeaks sends a really strong message that if you do this and we catch you, um, you'll face very serious consequences. We're talking, did you, we're talking about, um, in some way, individual journalists um, and the jeopardy they face. I, I wonder if um, you guys think that maybe journalism itself is in jeopardy. We, we, we've all went, we've gone through a period here in the United States with newspapers uh, shutting down. Certainly, um, many newspapers have shut down their foreign bureaus, and, and uh, my radio program, The World, relies to a great extent on freelance reporters, um, generally young people who've chosen to put themselves in not just dangerous places, but, but different places around the world. Um, and, and so there was a talk not too long ago about the, the profession itself um, being in jeopardy. Is, is that still the case, do you think? Where, where you know, I, I don't, I don't think so. In fact, a lot of us talk about what really might be, since Watergate in this country, anyway.
a sort of a golden age of investigative reporting. Um, since we launched our center in January of 2009, there are, have been 70 or so other centers like ours that have popped up around the country. Investigative reporters doing serious investigative journalism, not in the for-profit world, but doing in this nonprofit environment. Uh, some have argued, I think and wisely so, that the future of investigative reporting is no longer in the for-profit businesses. That the, the model for funding journalism that we've known all these years, the advertising, the subscriptions, really seems to be crumbling. And so if, if that goes away, what, what, what can sustain this kind of work? And I think we're, we're, there is this other model that actually is, is, is winning the winning, the winning Pulitzer Prizes or winning major investigative reporting awards. And it's not only in this country. If you look at a map, if you go to the ICIJ website, the, again, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, you'll see investigative reporting centers all over the world in practically every continent um, where people like myself and others are gathering together saying, okay, we know we can't do this reporting for one reason or another for the, the local newspaper or local radio TV stations. We're going to do it in another way. Um, I mean, they all face risk. Um, and, and, you know, and the reality is it's become a lot harder in this country post 9-11 to get access to basic information. It started with George Bush. You'd, you know, post 9-11, you'd ask for the most basic information. And they'd say, we can't give it to you because of national, national security, security reasons. Right. It had nothing to do with national oh, yeah. security, period. Um, and now Obama has continued that, uh, despite the fact that one would consider him a liberal. But it's, it's been the worst um, since, since Richard Nixon, really, in terms of getting access to information from our government in this democracy. And Tracy, you, you uh, work mostly as a freelancer now. Do you, do you find that people want you more these days um, and, and, or less? Uh, well, I guess it goes in waves. Uh, you have, um, depending on the, the, the time, uh, what's the, the hot the story, story the of hot the story, time. Right. Yeah, so it, 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 it does, uh, it's, well, Iraq for the last six, six months, um, everybody wanted stories from Iraq, but now it's kind of dying again, people are losing interest in what's happening on the ground in Iraq and are more interested on how the Islamic State is going to affect countries like America and France and Australia. So yeah, the, the interest has, although it hasn't completely left Iraq, it has shifted. So yeah, you always have this, this wave, but um, yeah, as far as, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's working as a freelancer, yeah, it's, it's tough, but I think it always has been, so. Yeah, it's really true. Well, I, and, I live in a part of the world where, you know, the news is never, Never stops. Never too much. You know, you know, <laughs> the, 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 but but, but I, I do think that what Joe talked about is really important because in Israel, for example, there, there, there is never a shortage of news and there is so much interest from everybody. But the biggest jeopardy to journalism in my country is foreign business people um, buying. <laughs> right. I mean, we have one example where you have a very rich American Jew, Sheldon Adelson, set up a newspaper in Israel that became the biggest newspaper in the country. Because it's free. And it's free. Yeah. And, it, and it's kind of like a Pravda kind of newspaper, which works for the prime minister. And that's a real danger to the profession and to the environment of journalism in the country. Um, and that so, said, there are still, for, for a country the size, as we always say, of there are yeah, New there Jersey, are a lot of, no, there are a lot of No, we have a free media, I mean, except for, for that example. And, and, you know, it's flourishing. And, there are, and my website, for example, you know, the, the, the internet is becoming a really important zone. But it's important that we have... In the, really independent places. And I think that this could be even, you know, in Israel we'll have such things in the future because the influence of the money holders on, on the news is becoming more and more problematic. I mean, that's how I see it in, in, in our small part of the world. Well, it's also in Eastern Europe. When I was in Croatia a year ago, Serbia, um, the, the reporters there were saying they can't do investigative reporting because all the, all the media is owned by people who are connected to the government and don't want anybody to report on the government. Right, right. Um, that's a problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's this is sorry. a huge issue right now in Turkey, where where Tracy is living too, and and uh, the government there is clamping down on media and the big corporations, including CNN, uh, Turk. They are afraid to to cross the government. The business. I, I was in Istanbul in June 2013 when they had the demonstrations in uh, in Gezi yes, Park. Yeah. It's a huge demonstrations, uh, and for Israelis it was interesting. So my website sent me to cover it, 
And I remember I had a terrible day in the square with tear gas and, and I saw police beating up young people and it was terrible. And then I went to my hotel room and I opened up uh, CNN Turk, the local news, and they have a documentary film about right. penguins. <laughs> that in penguins. the middle of this, you know, the prime time news, you know, people are getting, you know, it's a total mess in the city, things are burning, and they have a documentary about penguins in, Ant in Antarctica. And, and, and I mean, it was scary in a way. It was funny, but also scary to see it because Turkey is, you know, it's a democracy, it's, a, it's supposed to be a free country. Alarming. We, uh, the radio show, I work for the world often does surveys of, of newspapers around the world, not official surveys, but we have people who speak a lot of different languages um, and from a lot of different countries. And, and we found in the last few years that the media in, in places like India, China, um, and parts of Eastern Europe is exploding in some ways, but what's happening is something along the lines of what you're saying is that these Newspapers, radio stations, television stations will be bought by people with an agenda. The difference, though, is that you know their agenda. You go to the the liberal Haaretz or the right wing uh, Israel Today. Or, um, I, I, and, and part of me feels that the way things are going in America with the with the, the blue states and the red states and the purple states and this media and that media, at least it's above board, right? You know what Israel Today is. You know what Haaretz is. Um, is that a, a better thing, a better evolution um, for journalism? That kind of transparency you're saying? Well, the, the fact that, yeah. What you see is what you get. You what know you what see is, is what you get. You know what like you're Jeff getting. Like Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post? Yeah. Because he probably wants some influence in Washington. But um, is, is the news going to be carry a bent? You, you mentioned before uh, about if, as dictatorships are falling, is media opening up? Um, I saw in Libya when, after the Gaddafi re regime fell, and then the couple of years that followed, yeah, media was it, it was possible to write anything about about anyone. But after 42 years under a dictatorship, people didn't have any idea that media could be open. It was they, the only concept they have, the journalists, is that you have to have an agenda. You have to have a political party or a connection to someone, and that's what you push. Uh, they didn't have this concept of being unbiased or reporting what you see. It's just like, you know. Um, so I think it's, that can be a problem when uh, you see certain media that have a certain agenda. It sort of reinforces this idea that you have to report with an agenda. Well, I, I think an agenda is okay. The problem is, do you tell the truth or not? The, the, the CNN Turk example, if they were showing images from, from the square, but their commentator in the, in the or, you know, or the analyst would explain why the Erdogan government is actually doing it right, and the protests are wrong, I could live with that as long as, as you don't distort the facts. I mean, you know, here in this country, you know, I, I read, you know, in the morning I try to read two great American newspapers, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And I know that one of them is more left-wing and the other one is more right-wing, and I'm fine with that. But if I want to see, I especially look for news about the Middle East, but if I want to see you know, how things are, are being reported, I trust both of them, even though they have, you know, one of them is here and the other one is here. The big fear is that big money is causing certain you know, news outlets to just say the hell with the truth. We're just going to say what the boss wants us to write, and that's where the problem is. Right. There, there's a funny story from... Um, illustrating what Tracy said from the early days of um, the U.S. in Iraq. Uh, America set up a, a radio station and um, a newspaper that operated out of the green zone. And, and someone finally went to the, the newspaper and said, why is Paul Bremer's picture, he was the, the man running Iraq at the time, why is Paul Bremer's picture on the front page of the paper every day? He didn't do anything. And they said, oh, well, Saddam's picture was always on the front page of the paper, so <laughs> obviously Paul Bremer's picture has to be on the front page of the paper. And, and it is, when, when they realized that they didn't have to do that, it was this glorious moment, and you could just, <sighs> they could move on with the business of journalism. Um, uh, Joe, you were, you were saying it is a good thing or it's not a good thing to have the transparency with well, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure that, certainly in this country, that it's, it's 
the business, I think it's a combination of things of what we need to be concerned about. It's not only the business interests, and, the, and for, for example, Comcast owning NBC and owning um, all of our cable access for, the, you know, for a good, large part of the country. And there's, there should be concern about that. For this control of information in the hands of the few, that's always of great concern. But I think there's that when you look around the world at what various governments are doing, there's a lot to be worried about on that level, too. If you look at what hap what's happening in China, where uh, the, the largest number of journalists that have been jailed, that were jailed in 2014, for example, I have the number here, there were 200, 220, 225 journalists jailed worldwide in 2014, the second highest number since 1990. 44 of those were in China, 30 in Iran, Vietnam had 16. And there are a lot of other countries. So it's not, this, not the countries you would think about that happening. So they have that kind of concentration of government power and people wanting to hold on to power and not wanting to be held accountable um, that becomes a block to truth, a block that becomes an obstacle for journalists to do their job. Another thing that happened when I was in Russia back in October, in addition to the ban on foreign ownership of media, the Kremlin called all the major media in for a meeting to say, what's going on with all this negative coverage? Why can't you give us more positive coverage? You know, obviously. Of course, people went to the meeting. Because if you didn't go to the meeting, you might, you might end up uh, in a box somewhere. So, um, so I think there's, that's, that's a major concern. And I, and I think you know, Putin, as a, as a world leader, um, is a bad example for the rest of the world to watch. Um, you know, a lot of bad things are happening there. He has, you know, fairly uh, good approval ratings, as, as far as we can tell. Right? <laughs> That's what the media says. Anyway. Yeah, they right. written in the newspaper. Right, but if you talk to people on the street there, it's, there's a lot. There are a lot of people who think he's bringing Russia to, a, to, to new heights. But, but who knows? Um, but you talk to reporters, and there's real serious concern about what's going to happen to a free press in that country, and, and the same in China. So you have two of the biggest countries in the world where journalism is being really forbidden uh, and, and people are being murdered or jailed if they practice it. And that's of grave concern. This, this um, uh, and it's not really funny, but you know, this is a question from a guy wearing, who walked around wearing a 25 pound flak jacket for part of his career. Why, why would you be a journalist in Russia? I mean, the, the way you portray it, the way we see it, um, I mean, obviously you're not a journalist in Russia, but, but you were there, you were talking to these guys, and, you know, the same for you guys. Why, why do this? You... I mean, they're just like us. They're, they're crazy. <laughs> they're crazy. <laughs> right. Full stop. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. That was a yeah. good answer. They're passionate about what, what they do. Um, they really do believe in holding the powerful accountable and making sure that somebody is watching what the government's doing. And they do it despite all kinds of risks. It's their life, their livelihood, their families. They keep, they keep doing it. I mean, I, you know, they, they need to be applauded for that and supported in their effort to do that. Um, you know, we're, we're, even though things can be bad, relatively speaking, in this country at certain times, we've never come close to that. You know, and so we're lucky in that respect. Um, but, you know, you see that in Vietnam, too. I've, I've, I, was doing training in Hanoi and Da Nang, room filled with about 20 journalists in both places, work for all kinds of media outlets. Their editor is, is not a journalist. Their editor is a, is a Communist Party operative. I'm thinking, how do you operate a journalism <laughs> outfit with a Communist Party operative as, as essentially as your boss hmm. with great difficulty? But yet, they were coming up with really decent and strong investigative story ideas. No, they couldn't investigate the, pres the, the head of the country and the top government officials. And yes, the government was using them to go after lower level corruption so they wouldn't have to be bothered with it. But, but, you could, but they were still doing it and still wanting to do it. I mean, and that's, that's such a great thing. I mean, that's, you, you, when I go to places like that and see that, I mean, it's just inspiring, really. Um, it's inspiring for the world to see, I think. Well, I'm here. So with, regard, with, with, regard, <laughs> with regard to Russian journalists, I can say one of the, I mean, the books that influenced me most when I started this was uh, Anna Politkovskaya, yeah. a famous Russian journalist who was murdered, I mean, supposedly by 
some gang that most people would say by right. by Putin's own order because she was really investigating what was going on in Chechnya and her books I mean her writing is it's really top-notch journalism amazing and that stuff. book is called um, yeah in, in Putin's Russia there is it's there something is. like is this a job worth dying for is journalism yeah. worth dying yeah, there, for there, there, there's this one and she should I mean really amazing stuff and I, I guess a lot of these guys know that her name is they remember it every day they do and then when I was there they were um, they had some sort of demonstration to mark the anniversary of her death. It's been like ten years, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, and Tracy, you're you're doing crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just crazy. You're not. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I guess when you're out there on the the front line, you're surrounded by fighters who are every day putting their life on the line for something they really believe in. And I don't think we're really that different from them. Our, our motives. Um, because we're, yeah, we're taking risks as well, but uh, it's for something that we really believe in and that we believe is going to make a difference and make a better world in the long run. And it is worth taking a risk for that. From my point of view, I, I, I mean, when I do foreign assignments, I serve a smaller audience. You know, Israeli audience is, you know, how many people read Hebrew in the world? Um, but it's people who are eager to know about these issues. When me and my colleague went to Syria, it was the first time ever that an Israeli TV crew reported from the civil war in that country. And this is not something that is happening in some faraway land. It's, it's right next to Israel. So our, when our show was aired on TV, it had like um, create, uh, almost 30% viewership in the entire country. Um, because people really want to know about this. Or when I, when I did a series of reports for my website about the war in Ukraine, and especially how it's affecting the Jews living there, it was viral because people really are, I mean, so I, I feel that um, besides, you know, crazy and, and, you know, and why you're doing this, uh, there is still appreciation for, you know, if you want to take, if you're willing to take a risk to tell a story that is important to people. Do we need, um, uh, I'm, 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 I get to ask the questions because here I am, but I, I'm really interested in, um, we, we talked about groups like ISIS essentially doing end runs around journalists. Their, their productions are so slick and in some cases it's horrible to say entertaining. Um, do, do, do people need us anymore? I mean, you, you know, do people care about investigative journalism? Can't, um, you know, some kid with a, an iPhone do what you do in Syria? You know what I mean? It, it, are, are we in a situation now where, because anyone can do this, journalists, people who call themselves journalists, are less important? You still need people who, who don't have an agenda. Um, yes, because groups like this, they're, they're showing their side of it, their propaganda. Um, and yes, YouTube is full of all these, these videos and these um, uh, tweets and everything about what's going on, but a lot of it is faked, a lot of it is misrepresented. Mm. Um, so you do, you, there is still room for journalism and uh, unbiased journalism, for someone to go in there and work out what's right and what isn't and present it as uh, both sides of the story in, in, in uh, one concise kind of piece, I hope. <laughs> you know, I, th I think people want a source that they can trust follow the basic methods of gathering information. You know, I, I, you know a lot of people suspect that all of us come, come to our work with an agenda, right? right. But, you know, that's not, that, I think, is not true. Um, you know, when you think about it, it's like, it's like a scientist going into a laboratory. They may have some preconceptions, but you hope that they follow the scientific method in coming to some conclusion. And I think that what the least people deserve is that we follow a set protocol for what we do and do it that way so that we're seeking truth in the most objective way possible, right? And I think there's always going to be desire for that because if you just look at it, and there are a million places to get news and information, obviously, but people don't know who these people are and where, how they got the information and whether or not they have an agenda. And it's not even, the transparency is not even there. So I think there still is, at least at this moment in time, a need for journalists. <laughs> so you're okay for the next two years. Yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> Um, I, I could really go on forever. I, I wonder if there are questions from the audience, things that um, you'd like to get from the, any of the panelists. Yeah, we're going to um, we're going to open this up to people. Helene is out there. Are you? Here's Helene. So she'll get to people. I'm going to take the prerogative of the co-chair. 
can I ask a question? Um, because I'm I'm interested. In, I don't get to see four journalists at once very often. Um, <laughs> I'm lucky. My my sister's been a journalist, so I, I got to live in that world for a while, and that was very interesting and very rich. I want to talk about narratives. I want to talk about ob objectivity. And my question is, you know, we talk about agendas, and is that different from objective, quote unquote, reporting? Doesn't everybody come to a story with an agenda? Aren't there narratives that are competing, and how do you deal with those? I mean, particularly you, Amir, in, in an area of the world where the two narratives that are battling each other on a constant basis, how do you deal with those narratives? How do you get to the so-called truth? Um, well, obviously, on Israel-Palestine, it's the worst case of competing narratives. Um, and you just, I mean, when you, when I go to report, you know, specifically on that part of the world, whoever I talk to understands that I have a certain, I don't know, even a narrative of my own. Um, Israeli officials know that uh, my opinions are not always as, as, as theirs, and Palestinians know that I'm Israeli, which means I'm coming with a certain blend of you know, culture and education and beliefs, but you have to show people that you're fair. You can be, I think, you know, in today's world of journalism, it's very hard to be objective in, in the old sense that people watch you or read you and they have no idea what you think. It's very hard to do that. I, there are still journalists who do, and I applaud them. I'm not one of them. My readers can pretty much guess, you know, maybe what I think, but I hope that they, they think I'm fair, which is the, the harder part. You can have an opinion, but you know, it shouldn't interfere with your reporting, um, and it shouldn't affect the way that you present things. And I don't—I mean, the, the worst thing I can think of a journalist doing is, is like going after a politician in a vicious way because they don't like them or because you know they don't agree with them. Um, and I can say that when I've when I've covered other countries, the complexities of covering the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on a daily basis have helped me, because uh, you know, if you go, for example. Um, to these demonstrations in Turkey, and you talk to people who are in, in the square calling for freedom and democracy, I always remember that I also need to talk to somebody who supports Erdogan, the, the, the prime minister, the president. Then president. I mean, because maybe I don't like him, he's very hated in Israel, but he was elected prime minister and then president of Turkey a couple of times. So I can't just take the narrative of those nice people in the square, I have to talk to the other side as well. Um, and it's, it's part of the job. It's not always fun, because you want to sometimes get carried away with your own opinions and your own beliefs. But you, just, you have to, to remember that you know, every story has two sides or more. Four different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I covered Israel-Palestine for five years. And I had a, a very rude awakening within the first uh, few months when I was there. And essentially, I, I did a story that had fantastic, wonderful sound. I'm a radio reporter. And um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say the sound sort of overrode my, my critical thinking. And I missed a big part of, of that particular story. It was a, something that happened in Gaza. And there, there's quite a show when people are killed. And, and I got overwhelmed. It was, you know, the second month I was there. Um, and it was a good lesson, as Amir is saying, is um, you, you've got to take, you don't have to agree with everyone, um, but people should be allowed to express their opinions. It's not, but it's not only the Middle East, it's, you know, every issue has multiple sides, or at least two sides, abortion, gun control, minimum wage. Um, and I, I, th I think it really does come back to the fact that everyone has an opinion, you know, I'm, you know on, on all those issues. But when you're a reporter, you, you really, if you're a good reporter and, and, you're, and you do it in a professional way, you, you are following a method. There is a method. And you gather information. You verify information. You have multiple sources. You don't uh, avoid going down a path because you think it, it, dis it doesn't jive with your preconceptions. And the line that any good editor will, will tell a reporter is, look, if you leave here thinking the story is one thing and come back and write that same story, you should be fired. Right, because you, in the gathering of information, you should you should come up with new new things. You, your opinions should be challenged, and if you follow a method, just like again, like scientists do, uh, you're, that will override whatever opinions you have. 
even when William Sapphire joined the New York Times a long, long time ago, and there was turmoil in the newsroom about him joining. Um, the fact is, when he wrote his columns, even though they had opinion in them, he, he verified his information. So his opinion was, was based on fact, as opposed to a lot of what you hear on, on talk radio this week. He said, that's Are you going to say public radio? I was going to say public radio. <laughs> God, 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 forgive me. Um, on talk radio, I mean, those guys, they just, they just mouth opinions. They're not doing research for the most part. Everybody has an opinion that's worthless, for the, really, for the, I think, in the case of a lot of those guys like Rush Limbaugh. But I think the reality is journalist, a really good journalist does not want you to, to hear his or her opinion, but rather hear and, and see and, and listen to uh, view what, what essentially they've gathered in the course of doing reporting. Uh, yeah, well, working in a, in a conflict, it can get difficult as well, because clearly you only have access to one side of, of the conflict. So I think the first thing you really need to present your story as, okay, this is what this rebel group is going through on this side. This is what this particular family living in this area on this side of the conflict. This is their experience. So you have to present it in that way. And also take any chances you can to understand the other side. Um, meet with anyone you can. Um, I visited and stayed with a number of times a family that were very pro-Bashar, living in the middle of rebel-held territory uh, in Idlib province. And um, yeah, for them, when they went outside of the house, they couldn't speak their opinion at all. But inside the house, they loved having me there. And although they couldn't speak on the record, they would they mm -hmm. loved to tell me everything that, that was going on and, uh, uh, in the town and give me all their um, ideas of, of how they viewed the, the conflict and the FSA and the, the different forces. But um, yeah, so you need to take those opportunities when they come up. OK, uh, our panelists have talked about everything from penguins to ISIS. So it's your <laughs> turn to ask a question. But please do ask a question. So gentleman, Clay, right there. Thank you. You know, Amir, you, you initially talked about the extra difficulties you have as an Israeli journalist. And just as an aside, it's hard to believe that no one recognizes your accent immediately as an Israeli. <laughs> but Tracy, I wanted to ask you whether you had extra issues being a female journalist reporting in war zones. And could you talk about that? Well, the, on the one side, you're obviously a little more vulnerable being, being female, especially I, I generally I work on my own um, completely. So, um, But on the other side of it, I actually find, particularly in the Middle East, that so people become really protective of you. Uh, being a female, especially traveling by yourself, they get this, like, uh, this sister mentality. It's like, OK, we're going to treat you like you're our sister and our family, and no one can say anything about you or, or touch you. And yeah, so you do. Um, you have that side of it as well, which, and also as a female, you get a lot of access that male journalists can't. Uh, I can stay with families and um, hang out with the, the women when the men go off to fight and, and stay with them. Uh, uh, we were talking yesterday about um, uh, one time when I was in, in Idlib province, uh, staying in, we were in a, a basement area because there were airstrikes at the time. All the men had gone off to the front line to fight, so it was just the women and children. And uh, to begin with, they're all uh, well, sitting around making bets of which, which of the women was going to break down and cry first. <laughs> and then the airstrikes got a little heavier and things got a bit more serious. And some of the women did cry. But as soon as it eased up a bit, then it starts going back to the, I knew it would be you. And, you know. <laughs> but so, and some of the kids sitting there sleeping through the whole thing and others crying. And, but uh, as a male journalist, you would never get access to that side of side of things. And, and even just staying with the local families, um, seeing the guys coming back from the front line and how they interact with their wives and their kids. And um, this is a real privilege that I, that mm. I have uh, as a female journalist. I, I want to add just shortly that what you said is so interesting because also for me as an Israeli, anything that is a, a liability and a problem can also become an advantage if you know how to use it wisely. For example, you know, being Israeli in, in these places in the Middle East, you know, it's a big, big, big liability, but it also has advantages because we are part of the region and we live the culture. And I mean, I, mean, I remember I did a, a reporting trip to a Syrian refugee camp in Jordan, you know, a place really one of the most horrific places I've been to. It's like a whole city of tents and people. So Yarmouk. Yeah, and, and not, not Yarmouk, but uh, it's, uh, it's closer to the, it's the Atari, that area of Jordan. And uh, people, when, when we were, I was talking to people and, and, and they kept telling me, you're different than other journalists that we've talked to. Yeah. 
<laughs> and and I guess it had to do with the just the mentality and, and you know and, and my Arabic is 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 very fluent. Things come more naturally. Um, so it, it's so just like you said about being being a woman. You know, sometimes sometimes you know something that carries a danger with it also helps you in your actual work. Great. Uh, during the as one who listens to the news and reads the news, I was very disturbed during the Gaza war, to keep reading news and listening to it, and then finding these reporters who were reporting the news said, we weren't telling you the truth. Because had we told you the truth, some would have felt they were being, would have been killed or they would have been thrown out. And I like your comments and your, 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 what you would say about this, because we, the people that receive this news, and if we can't depend on it, it ain't worth a damn. Who was that addressed to? I, I, Bill, I can, was I'm, that addressed to Amir? Everybody. Oh, to everybody. Well, I, I can, I've, I've heard this for a long, long time, and um, I, I went to Israel in 2002. I, I've never personally felt the least, well, the, the very first time in Gaza, I was utterly terrified. They were the, the it was a funeral, and, and uh, Palestinian funerals were very colorful, very loud, and they were chanting death to the Jews. And I figured they meant me. Um, and, and it was very, very scary. But uh, as far as the reporting, I have never had a single problem in Gaza, in the West Bank, anywhere feeling threatened. And, and in fact, the reality is, um, it's probably not a smart thing to say, but the most frightened I've been was embedded with the US military because my safety and security is dependent on their largesse, um, being transported by them, being fed by them, being housed by them. Um, and you can bet that every time I filed a radio report uh, that you know they went on the internet and, and listened to it and I got corrections the next day. And it was, um, some of those corrections were benign, where I used the, you know, I didn't use proper military terms or something like that. Um, but some of them were, were not so benign. And I, I have friends who witnessed horrible things and were afraid to report them because they depended on the, the military. Um, I, I've heard the charges about Gaza and elsewhere. It's not something in eight years I ever experienced. I can add shortly about Gaza. I had friends, not Israelis, because the Israelis cannot go into Gaza today. The Israelis, the, the Israeli government doesn't let them, and Hamas is signaling that they're not welcome, and if they come, they will kidnap. But I had a lot of foreign journalist friends who were inside Gaza, and they did tell stories about, um, you know, kind of harassment, but not something like somebody putting a gun to their head, and you know, but, but these kind of hints that if you don't report it our way, you'll be kicked out. What some of them did was actually um, pass information to to um, to journalists who are not in Gaza, who are covering the war from the Israeli side, and have it come out that way without their name on it, so they couldn't be accused of it. I got a phone call one day from some reporter in Gaza who said, um, a rocket has just been launched next to my hotel. All the journalists are here. We can't report it, because if we do, will be kicked out, but you should have the word out. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, people, the good thing is that if we work together as journalists from different countries, and I, I work with Palestinian journalists a lot, by the way. They, you know, we both don't, I, I'm not going to name them here, but we work together. And uh, I help them when they need to cover something on Israel. They help me when I need to cover something. And of course, foreign journalists who can go into Gaza, which I can't, you know, they're a resource for me. So if we work together, different journalists from different places, we get better. There's a, there's a saying in Israel that over the there's been a hundred years of conflict, but there are two sectors of the societies that always worked together throughout the conflict, which is criminals and journalists. <laughs> so that's how it needs to be. Next. Hi, this is for uh, Joe Bergantino, and I have the advantage of knowing this story a little bit, but um, Joe. Other people have talked about being in the middle of a war zone and what happens. You, as you alluded to, were in Russia in a hotel room when 
something happened to you. Can you share the story with the audience? Because I think it demonstrates how dangerous it can be even in the middle of, of a hotel. Sure. Um, so, so we were uh, doing a training in St. Petersburg. Uh, and it was only about 20 minutes into the training on a Thursday morning. And I looked up and I saw two what looked like plainclothes policemen in the room in front of them with somebody from the hotel lobby, uh, from the hotel. She came up to me and said, uh, we have two immigration people here. They're doing their routine check of passports. I knew clearly this wasn't a routine check. Um, and they said, we just have a few questions for you. Will you come with us? They brought us into a room where they already were set up with about eight people, including two KGB agents. FSB, I guess is what they call them now. We, we could tell right away that they. Do they, they have badges? They, yeah, they, they have jackets like yours. Oh. <laughs> yeah. um, and, but they were clearly well-dressed, well, very well-dressed, and, and one of them was dressed to kill. And, and they didn't say a word. So <laughs> they, they took some information. They said, if you sign this, you can go back and do your training. We thought, OK, we'll believe them. We signed it, basically said why we were there, what visas we had. Went back into the room and uh, started the training again, looked up about 10 minutes later. They were back in the room, and this time they said, you must come with us. So they took myself and the person I was training with. At that point, I handed my, um, all my materials off to, to someone in the room and said, you know, take this um, and continue the training if you can. We went down to an immigration office where we were held for about um, five hours. And at one, one point, uh, the media showed up to interview us. Um, they must have called them, or our, our co-reporters co called them. Um, that's the point where they gave us tea and cookies. Um, when the media showed up. Then at one point, this immigration guy comes out and he says to us, look, sign this, um, admitting your guilt. And I felt like saying to him, I, I watch Law and Order. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not going to do such a thing. Um, but I said, no, we're not signing anything that admits our guilt. Three hours later, they come to us and say, OK, we're taking you to court. And this began what really was a three hour, three, four hour experience that really was the scariest part of the day. Um, Two of us were at that point separated from the, from the American consulate person who had been with us in the immigration office. Went into a Russian courtroom where it was a little bit like a scene from Saturday Night Live. We had an appointed uh, translator, a woman who was about 18 years old, who was translating for the first time uh, <laughs> Russian to English. So the judge would talk for about 10 minutes in Russian, and she would say three words in English <laughs> and giggle after she'd say it. <laughs> so at one point, I said to the judge, I said, um, Your Honor, I understand that we could have a legal representation in this proceeding. And she got translated back as saying, yes, you can, but it'll make no difference. Um, <laughs> so then began my out of body experience, <laughs> where I thought this could really go wrong. And I never really wanted to go to uh, Siberia uh, on vacation or otherwise. So um, luckily, uh, we um, became very cooperative in the courtroom and very nice, uh, as much nice as I could be. Um, and eventually the judge said, look, I'm not going to fine you. I'm not going to uh, send you to jail. I'm not even going to require you to leave the country immediately. Uh, but you cannot continue your training. And that ended the ordeal. Uh, we got back in touch immediately with the people who we were working with, the, the local opposition newspaper, who um, we asked them to continue the training in a secret location for the next two days, which they did, as far as we know. Um, and we went back, were debriefed by the um, US consulate people who said, you need to get out of here as quickly as possible, because the Russians could change their mind. It was overnight in the, in the hotel room. I couldn't sleep, so I wrote a letter to, to Vlad, um, which ended up being published on our website, to Putin, um, uh, talking about the experience. And we left at 5 o'clock the next morning. A, a, a driver picked us up, and we went to the airport in really the dark of the early morning. And we kept looking behind us to see who was following us. Because the car was pulling up right next to us as we were getting in this van. But we got out of there. And when, when we took off for Paris at about 7 o'clock that morning, it was a little bit like that scene from Argo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the wheels were off and we were we, still waiting to be caught. <laughs> right. No one was chasing us down the runway. Um, but we got out of there in time, too. But it was a very, very, it was a very um, frightening experience. Because we really didn't know what was going to happen to us. We knew full well they didn't want us there. We were told by the US consulate people that this went very high up in the Russian government, what was going on, that it was something that wasn't just local immigration, 
officials, the fact that the KGB was involved um, was very telling to them. Um, but it really sent a very strong signal to people like us who are trying to spread investigative reporting around the world that we're certainly not welcome in that country. It certainly is dangerous to be in that country and, and do what we were trying to do. And for the reporters there to do investigative reporting, it's dangerous for them too. Lane, next question. I think we have someone right there. Uh, I was wondering how you fact check things that you don't see with your own eyes that are told to you. I'm thinking of um, the Rolling Stone debacle, which has nothing to do with you, but I don't, and I'm not even sure whether you put it under the umbrella of investigative journalism. But if you don't see it or, or experience it yourself and you're told all of these things, how do you, in a war zone, check to see whether you're being told the truth? And then what you're reporting is indeed, as far as you can tell, the truth. Yeah, well, you do need to check with multiple sources uh, as much as you can. Um, you get to know, too, who's more reliable than others. So there's uh, certain people you know the information they give you is not uh, it is generally very reliable. Others, you know that it's going to be biased. So maybe you can get an idea of what's going on from them, but you don't really trust it. You're going to have to check it with a number of other sources. Uh, the other thing, too, is um, I've been shown so many times uh, this very same video by a, a rebel fighter in Syria of someone being executed that says, oh, this is Bashar, this is what Bashar is doing to us. And then you get a pro-Bashar supporter showing you the very same video saying, this is what the FSA are doing to us. So you do really have to be careful when people are showing you videos on their cell phones and making claims of who it is and what they're doing. Um, yeah, one of those cases was actually in, uh, it was a video from Mexico that had been shown, <laughs> shown to me by both sides of, on the Syrian conflict. It was from Mexico like five years ago. It was an execution by uh, some, uh, some warlord in Mexico. So, yeah, um, often what I do with uh, photos and, and videos, uh, particularly images, you can search a, a Google search, Google image, is really handy because people always publish, especially on Twitter, uh, photos. There was uh, long before they destroyed the the temple of, of Jonah in in Mosul. There were many photos going around on on uh, social media, claiming to be a photo of the Islamic State destroying the the temple of Jonah. Um, but yeah, quick Google image search uh, came up with this same photo uh, from two years before on um, being being used for uh, to represent many different different things, uh, different places that. Islamic State so, so apparently destroyed in Syria. Um, so you do have to be careful to check these things. Um, but yeah, as it turned out, uh, this was in their agenda. This is where this, um, this photo had emerged from. Someone had used it falsely, but it had emerged from information that they were planning to destroy it. So in the end, the, that information itself did actually come true, but the image was false. So yeah, you, you, it does take a little bit of of research, but yeah, through via sources on the ground and also um, internet searches and, and cross-checking, um, yeah, you do manage to get uh, a, a fairly good picture of, of what's accurate and what, what isn't. I think that case, though, just just to go back on it a second, you know, is, is a black mark on journalism. It's a little bit like the doctor who takes out the wrong kidney. You know, it's, I mean, stuff like that happens, but it doesn't happen a lot. Um, and what they did, and I was reading the report done by the people at, the, uh, at Columbia Journalism School about what went wrong. And I mean, so much went wrong in that case where, where the reporter did not do the, the very basic things that one has to do. Like if somebody tells you something, you try to verify it one way or the other. She didn't do that out of respect for the victim, which I could understand how that could happen, but it, it went completely overboard. Uh, she, did, she didn't talk to multiple sources, didn't didn't verify anything practically. I mean, it's almost, I mean, it, and the fact that it was approved by an editor, it's surprising that no one is being fired in that situation. Um, but it violated all the basic rules of journalism. Um, and thank God it wasn't uh, CBS or NBC or the New York Times that did it. It was Rolling Stone, but it's, it's in terms of the credibility of the media. But, um, but it, it is an outlier in terms of what really happened. Next question, Helene. Uh, 
I, I just wanted to add quickly that a lot of what I would do is essentially you're allowing both sides to lie. Um, and, and I'm not saying they are lying, but if you're in Afghanistan or if you're in some of the places where Tracy goes, it, it, Tracy often has the ability to stay in places for a long time, but if you're in running into a place in Syria, running into a place in Iraq, you, you essentially have to go to try and get both sides, and if they're lying, they're lying, um, but they have to present themselves. I mean, it's an awful thing to say, but um, it is often the best you can do. You can't go to the front line. You can't say whether, in fact, somebody's brother was killed by a, a certain group. You can only go to that group and say, did you kill his brother? Um, and, and it's often a, it's a horrible um, deal that has to be struck. Um, the, the difference, I would say, is there was sort of is, is a willful neglect, I would say, with the Rolling Stone case. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about the, your view of the American media. There, was, um, there is an amazing documentary called uh, Merchants of Doubt. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Uh, but it's about a small, well-funded group that is um, raising doubts about uh, scientific evidence. In this case, happens to be um, uh, global change, uh, climate change. And um, the documentary really raises a lot of questions about the um, strength of the media to do its job uh, in reporting what the truth is and what the facts are, rather than just or doing one side and then the other side, and not evaluating what is being presented by the other side, whichever side that is. And it seems to me that uh, with the social media, with everything else, that that's becoming more and more what American media is doing, and it's not doing a service um, to really bring issues forward and to really um, discuss them uh, objectively. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I understand your question. Um, that, 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 that documentary are, is about the fact that there are certain people funding the anti-climate change movement, right? Is that right? The, yes. The, the point that I'm trying to raise is that um, there are, that, that our society is so polarized right now and that um, a lot of the media feels obligated to give either side their due without evaluating the accuracy or the legitimacy of the points. And so as a result, um, in our media, there is just a lot of he said, she said, and a not, not a lot of analysis going on. Um, well, I, I think I tend to disagree with you because, I mean, I, I know that when, when I talk about this with other journalists and I talk about this with people that we teach investigative reporting to, we talk about climate change as one, one example of this. You know, if 99% of scientists believe there's climate change and 1%, you know, doesn't, do you always have to include the other side? I don't think so. It's like, do we still include people who say the Earth is flat? No. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a point in time where if there's really consensus opinion on something, then that really becomes the consensus opinion. That's what you, you end up reporting. I think, I think, to, I think if you use the, the, the fairness guide, guidelines that we use in general in reporting, apply it to something like that, then you're doing uh, the audience a disservice. You're doing readers a disservice. You're doing viewers and listeners a disservice. Um, but you know, there are not a lot of issues like that. Um, climate change, I think, is one of them. You know, you know, abortion is not that way. You know, there's certainly strong opinions in, on both sides. A gun, gun control, you would think, right? I don't know what you think, but I, I tend to think that Gun control seems to make some sense, but yet, uh, we, because there are, there's a large percentage of the people in this country that believe that we shouldn't control guns, um, that we need to include some of that in stories that we report. I, I do think that what you're getting at is reflected in research that, um, that I cite often when I talk about the need for investigative reporting. It was done by, it was actually commissioned by investigative reporters and editors, a national organization. Um, it was founded back in 1977. Uh, and it, it found that when you ask people what they want from the news, unfortunately, the first thing they want is the weather. <laughs> we all know why, who live here. The second thing they want is investigative reporting. 
And then when you drill down and you ask, okay, what do you, what do you mean by that? One of the things that they ask for is they say, okay, we want somebody to tell us basically what the truth is on certain issues. Because there's a lot of spin on every issue. I mean, going back was an issue that would, it would seem to be fairly simple, like minimum wage. One side saying, you know, if you do it, you're going to end up shutting down thousands of small businesses all across the country. The other side saying, if you don't do it, the income inequality is going to get worse and worse and worse in this country. So why isn't there somebody out there separating truth uh, from fiction in a lot of these major issues? Now, unfortunately, I think what, 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 what you're really getting at is, is somewhat correct in that there are not enough media outlets really doing the kind of in-depth analysis to really try to get at the core truth on some of the most controversial issues of our time. You know, that, that's certainly, I think, one of the things that media can be criticized for. Uh, will it change? Uh, I don't know, because cause getting to, cause doing that requires a strong commitment to really investigate and dig, dig deep into issues where a lot of media just don't have, the, don't have the time or don't make the time and don't want to spend the money to do. I think we have one time for one last question. Um, hi, guys. Uh, I am so very fascinated by the work that you do. Um, and I just sort of wonder, you take great risks. You're in countries that I would never think to travel to. You live there, you visited there, you teach there. 20 years from now, you're sitting at your dinner table with your friends or your family, and you're trying to, you're telling a story about an experience you had, something you saw, someone you met that really stuck with you, that really shook you to your core and made you think, I have to do this work, but I don't know if I can do this work still. What would that story be? Are you a reporter? <laughs> 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 ah, great, oh, bad thanks. Luck. <laughs> bad luck. <laughs> um, well, I guess, strangely enough, the only time I, um, or oh, the worst injury that I've actually received in six years of reporting in the Middle East was when I was sleeping in a what I figured was a pretty safe hotel in the safest city of, in Libya at the time. Um, but I had a, a bunch of men broke into my room and uh, they tied me up. They beat me up quite badly as well. Uh, but I managed to escape. Um, uh, they were fortunately very uh, distracted by going through my things. They had me tied up on the ground uh, with my hands behind my back. But I managed to get my hands free and jumped from the balcony. So I did manage to get away from the situation. But um, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was that was the closest call I guess I've I've uh, I've had. But um, yeah, following that, everybody just kept telling me go back to Australia, you're insane. Like you got, I'd lost everything too, because I ran away with what I was sleeping in. So um, yeah, I lost all my equipment, I lost everything. And uh, I work as a photographer and as a writer. Um, so I, I could still work as a writer, but it's sort of like half of what I do was, was gone. Um, but I still stayed in Libya, uh, I guess, for about another six months after that. Um, yeah, and people kept, in this, those first few weeks, people kept telling me I'm, I'm crazy, I should go back to Australia. But to me, it was sort of, well, what am I going to go back for? I hadn't lived in Australia for, for 10 years. I have nothing there. I go back to Australia. I go back as like a failure or, and, and, and do what exactly? So, whereas if I stay, I prove that they don't win. You know, like I, I can still uh, keep working. There's, there's nothing wrong with me. I can stay there and still work very effectively um, with a, borrowed pen and paper and uh, in the, the hotel lobby, the um, receptionist let me use the computer at 2 a.m. so I could type out my stories and send them. And um, yeah, uh, a couple of months later, I actually won one of my first international awards for my work in Libya um, that I'd actually filmed with a little point and shoot camera that one of the rebel guys had lent me. So um, it turned out to be the best decision that I made was, was staying in Libya and it, it strengthened me uh, a lot um, having gone through that and then and stayed, uh, yeah, it just made me so much more determined. Whereas it, I, I guess, yeah, there was uh, some moments there where I, it could have gone the other way. I could have given in and, and sort of said, all right, I'll, I'll pack it in and I'll, I'll do something safer. But um, well, Hard to compete with that story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing story, really amazing story. 
for me, the hardest moment, I mean, we've talked a lot about ourselves, but we have to remember that the most important people in journalism are not the journalists or the sources. For me, the hardest moments is always when I feel that somehow somebody who talks to me or works with me could be in jeopardy because of doing that. And it could be because of investigative reporting. Uh, it could be a government official in Israel or on the Palestinian side that gave me a good story. And people are now looking who, who gave a to on the story, how did we get to them. The most frightening one was when I did a story in, in Jordan, which I mentioned about the Syrian refugees. And um, um, it was later aired on Israeli TV. And then what happened is that the Assad government tried to portray the people who we interviewed as traitors because they spoke to Israeli TV. Mm. And I said, OK, I'm out. I mean, if somebody gets hurt because they talked to me, I'm not continuing to do this. But I, I got in touch with the people, and they were actually, you know, they were Care, but they said no. I mean, you know, you're like, you're like a brother to us. You, you talked to us. You, you told our story. Um, we we had a we connected and we kept in touch over email, and, and it was really reassuring that um, that the, the the response was not uh, you ruined my life. I don't want ever want to hear from you again. But you know, respect for the job and for the way that we portrayed it. Um, but really, I mean, I think the most frightening moment, except for being tied up in a hotel in a strange country is, you know, you're thinking about the sources. And, and it has to go also with what we talked about technology earlier. I mean, you know, when Joe said that the government can track down what journalists are doing, what that means that, you know, if they can look into your cell phone or into your email, that's putting people at risk. It could be anywhere from, you know, their lives to their jobs to their freedom. And that's the one thing I think which is really making it really hard. I mean, when you go to countries where um where journalists are putting their lives on the line every day uh, just by doing their basic work, where they risk being tortured and jailed. Um, or you hear of, and I've, I've been to situations where people have talked about their families and their fathers being jailed for, for just doing basic journalism. Then you realize that this is a profession that's, that's not just about us and, and what we do on a daily basis, but it, that it's, its role in our society, whether it's here in, in democracy or in, in dictatorships, that, it, it, that the role that we play when we do the, the best work that we can do is, is just so very, very important. And, and that's, that's what really is inspiring. Um, that it's one thing to, to, to do stories where you're, you know, there is no risk. Um, that's a lot easier. But when you, when you are putting everything on your line, on the line, your family, your livelihood, your own life, and that really, that really does inspire. If you go down to the museum in Washington, if you haven't been there yet, there is a wall of journalists who've, who've died in the, in the line of duty. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not just because they happen to be in, in war zones or conflict situations, crossfires. It's because, for the most part, a lot of them are from Russia, uh, for the most part, they were just doing what they're supposed to be doing, holding the powerful accountable. And yet there's a wall. You know, it goes on and on and on. Uh, more than a thousand people over the past 23 years who are dead just because they were doing what journalists are supposed to do, and that's hold the powerful accountable. And, and their loss, their, their lives, and what they, what they did and what, what, they, what they lost, it, you know, I think drives me to continue what I do, and I'm sure it drives all of us to continue what we do. So I want to thank Aaron, Tracy, Amir, and Joe. I, w I want to say thank you for uh, on behalf of the JCC for being here tonight, uh, for providing us with the news from places that are very difficult to get that news, for your thoughtfulness, for your selflessness, and uh, I have two words for you, which is to stay safe. And thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you.